All right, welcome to another Spring Office Hours. My name is Dan Vega. With me, as always, is my friend and coworker Deshaun. Today we have a Good special morning. guest, a friend and a coworker as well, Greg Turnquist. Uh, so this is episode number nine. Again, we've had, I think, one other guest on here. This is our second guest. We're excited to have Greg, and I'll just turn over to Greg and let Greg tell you a little bit about himself. Well, hey, everybody. Thanks for letting me come on to Spring Office Hours. Uh, what, I mean, somebody says, you want to come and talk on a live stream or a podcast about spring? I'm like, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, if you don't know, I work, I'm actually on the spring team, a staff engineer, and uh, I'm currently the lead for Spring Data JPA, what I like to call the, the third most popular project probably in the whole spring portfolio. So, And I say that not to boast or anything, but when people want to build an app, <laughs> they need they always need to store data. Um, at least I have. I don't run into many apps that don't store data, and people are picking relational databases like four to one, like heavy, big time. So I say that more as a joke, just because every day when I come check into work, I look at issues, and there's always more issues being open against Spring Data JPA. So that's that's the fun in, in, in here. But uh, I love it. It's awesome. Cool. So we'll talk more about Spring Data. I know you have some things to share on Spring Data, but before we get started, I just want to kind of talk about kind of the other side of some things that you're doing. I see your Twitter handle there at Spring Boot Learn. Uh, you do a lot of content creation, so I'd like you to kind of talk to us about that. Yeah, I'd uh, I'd actually it all stemmed from this idea that I well I, I launched a YouTube channel back in 2019 in the, in the fall and it. It kind of started as this idea of I'm about to start writing a book about Spring Boot. Maybe what would be cool is if I made a video or two about it and that would, you know, build kind of build the community or grow a community of people interested in Spring Boot that would be interested in a book like that. And and then I, I I've reached a point now, I've made about 70 videos in the past two and a half years. And now wow. I'm at the point where I'm now in the book that I'm currently writing about Spring Boot that's coming out at the end of the year. I have links going back to video. Be like, okay, we just did a section on spring security. Now here's a link. Go watch a video if you want more interactive content. So it's almost like gone the other way around. Nice. So um, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, man. No, no, you you just you brought up something there. Um, I, because I, I, I create videos as well on YouTube. And one of the things that I've always heard from the people that I learned from, um, the Daryl Hughes of the world. It, you know, they say the first hundred videos you make on YouTube are not going to be great. Um, yours are really good. So I'm wondering, do you do you find that statement to be true personally uh, or what you see from other creators? And if that if that is the case, you know, what advice would you give to somebody who wants to start their own YouTube uh, channel? Well, uh, like Deshaun. <laughs> do it. Do it, Deshaun. Okay. Um, well, there's this, other, there's this other guy I like to follow on YouTube. Or, well, it's a company now. It used to be a one-man job. Now it's like 11 creators called Think Media. And their slogan is, oh, yeah. you just got to press record. So um, I had this really, I had this, I was loaded up full of energy back in October of 2019. And I grabbed my iPhone and this little thing called a gorilla tripod in my hand. And I went out in front <laughs> of my house and I sat there like this and held it. And I just started talking about spring boot. And then... I had my dog with me. So then I filmed a clip of me walking the dog because um, <laughs> I'd seen this author out of the UK talk about how to become an indie book, book publisher. And he was doing the same thing. Only he went out feeding horses or something. And it was hilarious. So I said, well, if this guy can do it running around in the backwoods of rural England, why can't I do it in the neighborhood here? And I found out that lots of people are doing that. And I was like, let me just, if I just talk about Spring Boot, what I know, I, I, I I like to say I know a bunch about that. And I found other people <laughs> kind of found that enjoyable. So I was like, all right, let's go. Let's make number two and number three and and so on and so forth. And it's just, to me, it's been fun. Yeah. And, you know, I, I'll say this because we both create videos on spring. Um, you know, I think like a lot of creators that get into this always worry about, well, Greg's already doing videos on spring boot. I shouldn't. No, I can't do that as well. And there's always that picture of somebody going down the grocery store aisle with the 50,000 different packs of water. Like there are always like options to, to, to yes. choose from. 
And I, I always tell people like, you know, there, there may be the same message coming from different YouTube channels, but it, there's always a different messenger and different people kind of vibe or click with different people uh, or different messages. So uh, I don't know your thoughts on it, but um, I, I see somebody in the space talking about Spring Boot already as validation and a reason for me to want to do the same thing. And I don't look at you or anyone else in that space as competition. Like we're all just doing the same thing, preaching the good word of Spring. So uh, thoughts on that. Uh, well, there's actually a word out there called coopetition, where um, it's <laughs> yep. like we're, it's like we're, we are competitors, but not really. It's we're we're helping each other out, and it's it's it to me. It's proof that it's like you know the whole world of spring boot or gardening or right. I don't know lumberjacking, whatever. They're all there's, <laughs> they're huge. You you there's no one person owns that all. You know maybe right. maybe Hollywood and movie roles are a very finite gate kept acid but talking about everyone's got a different flavor of spring boot like you're saying yeah uh, a different style and the real mental mind shift for me was realizing i can go make a video about something that's the same topic that i made a video about a year ago i can <laughs> yeah. it, put a new spin on it put what's updated use you know since then i've learned a lot of things in styling or editing and i can go remake the same kind of i made and people enjoy that too because i go to youtube for a lot of entertainment probably too much but and i find videos from the same people on the same topics i go watch them again i go watch the new stuff because it's fun i enjoy it and yeah this idea that things are saturated is i think a, a, a myth so i'll say that early in my spring boot career um i was watching all of the videos that i could find and it didn't matter uh if i seen it or if it was the exact same talk at a different conference i was watching all of the videos that i could find and i was trying to learn through osmosis so there's there's some talks uh that some of the team has done uh that i have seen 20 times 20 different versions of, right mm -hmm. over the days and uh and it was valuable right i you hear things it's not like you can't just hear something once and learn it you need that reinforcement. You know, we work with partners and customers and we're helping their team and we're saying these things over and over again and repeating, repeating. And then finally they, they start repeating it back. Like you have to hear things more than once. You don't learn it the first time you hear it. So yeah, I you don't need, you don't need all this expensive gear. Like 10 years ago, maybe you did have to go buy a $2,000 camera to actually even just start thinking about it today. <laughs> no, um, I actually know a creator that got to a hundred thousand subs and, thailand using an iphone an iphone and a gimbal and so That's we're talking crazy. yeah what's what's an iphone a thousand dollars today and a gimbal is 150 dollars. Yeah. our good friend uh kote he did a lot of i yeah. didn't realize i learned this like recently that he did a lot of his and i'm i look at his videos as being really high quality i like everything he's put out uh so yeah that's uh surprising not right it shouldn't I, be surprising I, anymore uh, you know, they call it blogging, like video blogging, blogging. But so I was like, what do you call it if it's blogging and coding? Loading? I mean, it, <laughs> so. Well, and that's, um, you know, Clog. TikTok is really on the rise. And, and maybe, you know, people think of TikTok and it's like dancing videos, sure. But I think TikTok, one of the reasons that it's really become like popular is because there's less production into it, right? Like there's a camera. And it's usually a phone and it's just shooting. And it's like, I, I care about the content, not the hours of video production that you put into it. I found some of my best content was I did, I do a lot of coding live stream sort of after hours. You know, I don't do it. I don't do it on the clock compared to certain people in this live stream, but um, <laughs> I would do it after hours. And um, I linked up to uh, YouTube, LinkedIn. People may not realize LinkedIn has live streaming support on it. Twitter and a couple of Facebook groups. So I'm like, let me just put it out there. Whoever's, whoever wants to consume this content, I'm trying to put it into their hands as easily as possible. And then when I'm done, I actually pulled down the episode and pushed it to anchor.fm, which is Spotify's podcast service. So they offer a free hosting solution and then all the people can listen to the audio variation of it. So throw nice. it out there, let people consume it and get into the glory of Spring Boot. I don't think I've ever streamed on Twitter. Uh, did you find any like luck there? Um, 
I guess people want the part of it is I, I think it was like over a year ago I, I decided to open a Twitter account that was specifically for this my video content yep. and mm-hmm. you only get 15 characters that's why it's not spring at spring boot learning because that was not legal. <laughs> and so yeah um, I set it up and I was like this account I'm just going to use it and talk about content creation and spring boot traffic and stuff the other one's my general software engineering handle and and it's like grown to 1200 or 1300 p- people in like one year and so i was like that's great i signed up for a stream yard account i said well let me link it up to here who knows how many of the people want to consume it from this platform i don't know but <laughs> why not if there's no extra effort to put it there cool um all right any any more questions deshaun on content i like took I said, I know tons you're... of notes i'm i'm uh... I'm I'm in the analysis paralysis phase right now. Yeah. Uh, yep. But this definitely helps. Thank you. Cool. Um, so let's switch gears to kind of the spring world. Before we get into spring data, um, we have some exciting changes coming later this year with Spring Boot three, Spring Framework six. I know you've talked a lot about this on your live streams. Just curious, what are your what are you excited about uh, with the, with those two new releases coming this year? Well, the, the, the coolest thing to me is um, not the Spring Boot 3 slash Spring Framework 6 per se, but the fact that all those are going to be re-leveled up to Java 17. And mm-hmm. um, Java 17 has got a lot of cool stuff in it. And sometimes it's the it's some of the little things, like you can use the VARs. You know, that's something maybe for, you know, a little chunk of code where you don't have to declare the type. But there's also where you can do this instance of pattern you know it's an old cliche where it's like okay is this thing an instance of a subtype and then in the inside the statement you downcast it well they now have java 17 brings a way to automatically downcast it by putting the type in the instance of check and yep um there's just there's other cool stuff like the list of the lit array.util.list has got java.util.list has a, a list dot of it makes it easier to go create you know, a list or, you know, there's also map dot of set dot of these. And it's actually, it's actually a bonafide immutable list. Yep. Yep. Not out to my detriment when I didn't know that. <laughs> yep. But um, I'm starting start to use more of that, you know, just slim it down and write more succinct code. Um, and other good, the other thing is, it's just, it's the JVM is faster on Java 17. And now they're like, they're, mm. I think they're starting to do like first Java 20. So, <clears throat> this whole high speed release train has been crazy because I remember on yeah, the podcast, I've, podcast I've, it kind of jeered at the, the slow rate releases came back way back in the days of Java five. Yeah, I've mentioned a couple of times on our on our spring one tour that, you know, the new release cadence is, is what I really think has propelled Java to you know, it was kind of stagnant for a while and just kind of like changed the mindset of people going, Oh wow, this is like moving fast and things are changing and things are getting better. And as you said, once everybody's kind of, once we know somebody's using Spring Boot 3, I know I no longer have to go, well, what version are you on? I know that you're at least on 17 and you can take advantage of all the great language features. And like you said, performance out of the box, security out of the box. Um, so I'm excited too, to see the kind of community shift uh, towards that. Now, people that you know, people that are relatively new to Spring may not be aware that uh, Spring actually has this, a, lo- a very long history of backwards compatibility. So, mm-hmm. uh, and slash forwards compatibility. So, the, you know, they try to make it as simple as possible to just bump the version up to the newest one. You know, you if you've got an app built against Spring two point seven, the current supported version of the two that's out there. You know, it should be minimal effort to just jump up to Spring Boot 3. Now, you're going to have to jump up to Java 17 quite naturally, but um, this is where we spend a lot of effort and, and we may solve a problem against the current main branch, but then we'll backport fixes, you know, bug patches, things like that to previously supported branches. Not necessarily, won't necessarily take new features to older versions, but we want to try to make it where, you know, the whole, the whole portfolio is well supported and it's not a major disruption. Um, now, there are certain things we try to deprecate or give the signal that they are going to go out. Spring Boot has a policy of, you know, they'll deprecate it, say, in the next version, and then the version after that, it's their discrimination to take it out, their discretion, I should say, to take that out. Um, 
So you want to stay tuned to that deprecation warnings. But um, if you go just in, you know, to bump your app up, if you're stuck back on boot 2.3, just go, you know, take it up to boot 2.4, then 2.5, then 2.6, and 2.7. Mm-hmm. And hopefully that's going to be a minimal effort for you to jump up to a currently supported version. Yep. I, I guess I have one more question on that. So we look at it as like all these great new features are coming in Spring Boot 3, but you're an engineer working on the code that is going to ship in Spring Boot 3. Have you, have you found every, anything to be like, wow, this was a big feat to, to make happen? Um, ever heard of Hibernate? <laughs> we're we're bumping to Spring Boot 3. One of the things that's going to pick up is a major rev of Hibernate called Hibernate 6. And so... Um, there's there's stuff that's moved around there. Oliver Dropbomb, the uh, the previous team leader for Spring Data, uh, actually he spent several months to go through and make sure all of Spring Data JPA was working with that because the boot team wanted to to migrate up to that. And we've had to also interact with the Spring Batch team, which is uh, they sit on top of relational database stuff. And so that's that's been some effort there. I was kind of like, thankfully that was not on my plate. The other stuff that's big is that um, our story for Spring Native, where um, you know it's kind of a kind of a cliche joke now. By now, the job of ten years has been chided as you know, well, gee, your startup time is horrible. You know, twenty seconds to start up an app, but for an app for a web server that stays up for you know a year, is that is that a big problem? Maybe not. But um, if you're running something like a, 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 a AWS Lambda functions or something, then a 20 second startup time is the death knell. You want sub second time. So being able to build yeah. a spring app that runs on Coral VM with, you know, 20 second startup time is awesome. That's what spring native is about making possible. But the glue code that has to be written to make that happen is like a nightmare in, in a sense, some of the engineering. That, you know. And that's a consequence of adding it on at this phase. You know, if that was something that had existed 10 or 15 years ago, maybe yeah. it wouldn't be the, the, the challenge that it is, but um, we're all having to chip in on some of that stuff to help get that. Yeah, through. and I'm not sure if it was, I, I don't, I'm not sure if I saw it from Jurgen or maybe Michael, but I, I saw a slide somewhere that said like, this was one of the biggest engineering feats the Spring team has had to take on because, you know, when you talk about Spring Native and you want to be able to compile down the native, it's not just one piece of code, it's every single project needs to be able to support that. And so, yeah, so I feel for you guys and I'm thankful we have a bunch of really smart people to take care of that. So, and we can help, we can go <laughs> grab the milestone releases and we can start toying around and pull requests are welcome. I'm just saying, <clears throat> just throwing it out there. <clears throat> Deshaun has been vigorously testing Spring Boot 3 native stuff. So, <laughs> cool. That's and that's part of it is there's um, I, I, I I like that there's a message kind of, I think a lot of people are carrying it out on the social media that engineering is not just the, the, the typing the code and, and doing stuff. There's, we need things like, you know, we need people to write documentation that test out stuff that, you know, there's, there's a whole breadth of activity that happens with um, shepherding new releases out. And so, you know, this is, we need this too. We need, we need people that consume the product, you know, that, that are mm-hmm. using it. You know, 20 years ago, it was kind of a joke, but don't don't ever upgrade to the dot .o version of something because that's the version that nobody has tested. Go to the dot .1 <laughs> version. But right. I feel like it's not as bad today as maybe that was at the beginning of my career. And things weren't moving as fast, right, 20 years ago. Oh, the idea, and sure. I, I heard this last night, so it's kind of in the top of my head, uh, like two releases a year, four releases. We used to send out CDs, right? You can't send out CDs every day, <laughs> but... But now, like the release cycle, we figured some things out, and uh, yeah, it's yeah. a different time. I'm a big fan of the continuous integration, continuous deployment stuff. So that's that's really cool because I mean, my I mean, technically, my first assignment ever was building other people's code. And so I, my job was to come in and run the code and to make sure nothing broke, you know. And I started building my own tools by hand to have a cron job start that task at a minute past midnight. So when I would come in, it would be almost done. Uh, so I was like a human CI server, but anyway. Do you, you, know, I, go ahead. do you know what's really scary is we probably have some viewers who don't know what a CD is. <laughs> that's that's where hey, we're going. What was that? I can't pitch uh, it. <laughs> Ouch. Oh, boy. All right. Well, um, all right. 
So I want to well, on that to, note. Yep, on that note, I want to shift to uh, spring data. So before we, I know you have some slides you want to go through, and we'll just, we're going to keep this as kind of like an open discussion. But before we get into that, spring data, for anybody who doesn't know, what is it? Why should they care about it? Just give us kind of the high overview of what it is. Well, the spring data is sort of your go-to solution in the spring portfolio to get data. Okay, but what is that? What in the world does that even mean? It's, you know, something that we've learned is that when you try to create like an abstract interface to sort of capture all the behavior, what you end up with is a lowest common denominator. Okay, so if you start talking about what's a unified solution to talk to, <clears throat> you know, a relational database through through JPA or MongoDB or Redis, you end up with almost nothing, you know, if you look for a one, a united interface that would do that. Because all those data stores had work differently, they have different characteristics, and people pick them for different reasons. People people want to go to Redis because it's a very high speed, efficient key value store fundamentally. People go to MongoDB for for documents and documents within documents within documents. And some of their aggregation pipeline stuff. <clears throat> and people go to people go through JPA today for relational database stuff because partly that's just how we all think today. Um, is relational databases have a you know solid grounding and stuff. So what is something to be efficient about? Well, if I go to any of these data stores, I need access to their native operations. But you know, one of the first things you need control over is resource management. So a lot of them have a ceremony of how do I connect to it and open a connection and open, you know, what's the dance to link up to it and then finally run my actual business based, you know, query for lack of a better term. And then how do I close the connection correctly so that I'm not leaking resource stuff. And so that's one of the things that spring has been big on for, from the get go from back in the, the early days. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but we started noticing you know, we would notice things like um, a lot of queries are very simple. It's like, let me query this table or let me query this document. Just give me all the entries in that table or document. Or, you know, with and maybe with the crude filter on it applied. You know, just let me filter down and find everybody in this table that has the last name of Baggin. Or let me look and find all the documents that link to Baggin, that kind of thing. And so in that sense, do you really need to be writing that custom query when we could write it, we can de denote it in the name of a method signature. So you can write this find by last name. And if the, if the interface with this definition in it is also has the generic parameters to connect to, you know, employee, I've got an employee type with a first name and a last name field. Why can I not do find by last name with an argument and that's kind of one of the things that Spring Data does. It can go read this method signature, you put it in the correct place, parse it, and write that query for you. So you're like, well, good. That takes a load off my shoulder. You know, I before I came to the Spring team, I worked on a system where I wrote by hand over 200 queries to manage um, event correlation data, and a lot of the queries were very cut and dry like that. They were very simple, so I wrote them one time and never looked again. But imagine not having to write 80% of your queries and instead focus your effort on that crazy query that joins 20 different tables, but the business office runs that only once a month. And so I can spend my effort honing and making that more efficient. And so Spring Data lets you do this kind of repository-based solution with, with derived queries like that. But it's not the only thing it does. It also has options of, imagine you're filling out uh, like a customer has a filter on a page where you're listing all these employee objects. And somebody wants to type in a filter box. Um, this time they're filtering on first name or they're filtering on last name or first name and role. But the criteria fluctuate. So we have a concept called query by example. We're just grab all the fields from the search box, stick it into a POJO object and hand it over to Spring Data to query based on that. And it will filter based on the fields that aren't null. <clears throat> so again, no need to write the query. It's very straightforward what it's doing, and it's it's pushing functionality right into the user's hands, and it's also type safe and secure from attack. And then it also comes with that same resource management baked in. And it's just other ideas like that that 
We don't need a common unified interface between all the things, just all the data stores that are supported by Spring Data kind of have this feature. So it makes mm -hmm. it easy to rise above thinking too heavily of the data store and instead shift to a business oriented mindset of what do I need to do to serve the business and use cases and stuff? Yeah, and so for me, you know, everything Spring does across kind of the portfolio of projects is take that thing that's kind of complicated, abstract that away from me and just give me kind of a simple paradigm across my application to work with. And Spring Data is no different. Like I don't want to I don't want to write my own JDBC code, like low level JDBC. It, if you're doing that these days, you're, you're wasting your time on something that you could be better spent somewhere else. So um, yeah, just being able to start up an app and go, I don't need to worry about this right away. I can connect to a database and get a list of customers from there without having to spend days getting that CRUD information going. So pretty cool stuff. And you know, that was the kind of a, that was kind of a working theory that was sort of bubbling up back in 2014 and then they released Spring Boot. That was when the first release of Spring Boot went out, which is now eight years ago. And you know that that clicked with a lot of people of let me get above this low level infrastructure management and <clears throat> API nonsensory and let's let me rise up to actually build the features that I'm trying to build because people went crazy for Spring Boot. Like, oh my gosh, I don't need to I don't need yeah. to about data access or something it's just like pow well and that's what a lot of web frameworks were doing at the time right like in ruby on rails it was like i don't need to worry about that stuff i want to quickly like write an app and worry about the business logic not all that low level infrastructure so i mean there's a reason every like you would see these uh, like startup companies that would have five people in them <laughs> and one person is the app developer there's a reason they were using ruby on rails because right. they needed to turn production fast Yep. Cool. So that was a good introduction. You want to go through some slides now? Yeah, let's, let's have at it. Let's throw this on here and switch over to that. Cool. All right. It's 10 p.m. Do you know where your relational database is? This is a it's a title I kind of cribbed off somebody I knew in college that had done a presentation on, on GPS systems. And it was, you know, they called it, it's 10 PM. Do you know where your tracker is? So they talked about automated tractoring systems that can be operating off GPS. And I always remember that. I don't know if their project was any good, but I, the title caught my attention like that. So um, there's something I mentioned earlier on when we were going at it, which was that, um, Relational databases have dominated the landscape like four to one. And what I mean by that is we have data. We have data in that when people go build a new app, of it, uh, if you go to start.spring.io, that magic site that we're always seeing Josh Long using in his cool presentations to whip up a project in five minutes or less, people, people without fail need to store data. I mean, there's, there may be an app here or there that doesn't, but by far they do. And they almost are always picking a relational database because that's just, that's where the industry is. After 15 years of NoSQL databases, dozens and dozens of them, people mostly need relational databases. They don't, and there's not a, that's not a, sli a slight against one party or the other. It's just kind of the nature of things. If you don't need one then you know, or if you need a different type of data, that's fine. But uh, this is sort of the reality we're in. Um, and that's because apps live and breathe data. I mean, that's what I'm trying to say here. Is that, in fact, I made a video where this is sort of my opening tagline was apps live and breathe data. And I went into some of the query options that you have when, with Spring Data itself. Um, you know, I've always thought that an app without data is not really an app yet. So it's like more like an idea. Or I can build, I can mock out or scaffold some web pages and stuff and start working on the look and feel. But until I, Hook it up to the real data. It's just a, a stub concept. So what do you do? I mean, what happens when you come to check out Spring? You know, maybe you're watching this live stream right now and you're like, I, I've, I've been hearing about Spring. Let me check it out. This is my first place where I'm going to go look into. What happens when you check out the portfolio and you're like, I want to I want to work with a relational database. And what you find is this: you see something 
called JDBC template. I'm like, okay, but I've heard of JDBC. It's for persisting data. So I guess that's that's a tool that'll let me do that. But but then I hear there's this other thing called Spring Data JPA. Um, I, I've also heard people mention JPA. I'm not I'm not sure what the difference is between that and JDBC. And well, wait a minute. There's a Spring Data JDBC. Now I what do I do now? Because there's JDBC template and Spring Data JDBC. What this this is getting confusing. And what in the world is R two DBC? I mean that R two D two. Um. Logo here, but if you go to r2dbc.io, you may see an r2d2 inspired theme. And watch us get demonetized. Um, so what the heck is that even? You know, for these, oh, come on now, this is getting ridiculous. So, <laughs> spring data r2dbc, oh gosh. Um, you know, I heard about this website that would randomly throw together buzzwords and like spring stuff, and it was hilarious. You know, abstract singleton proxy factory creator, something, you know, like that. So, so I mean, what do you do? Throw your hands up and say, okay, I'm forget it. I'm going back to Ruby on Rails. Well, what you pick and what you do, it depends on what you're trying to do. I love this because I actually made, I actually did a live stream where I just sit there and talked about, it's okay to say it depends. People, people answer questions with this and then they feel guilty. And I'm like, do not feel guilty because we live in a complex world. So That's my go-to. Whenever yeah. anybody asks someone, and, and I'm not sure yet, I go, it depends. And then I ask more questions. <laughs> and, uh, my friend in Nashville, that, uh, he's, a, he's a very high-quality coder, is also a, a software skeptic. So he's the, he's the person that said, uh, you know, he inspired me to say, it's, it's okay to say it depends. So first of all, why don't we talk about exactly what are these things, JDBC versus JPA versus R2DBC? Because if, first, if we can understand what these are, Maybe we can understand what the what what these toolkits are and better understand what to pick and when. So JDBC is the acronym for Java Database Connectivity. And if you're if you're fresh and new to software engineering, gear up because the world is full of acronyms. Okay. Um, JDBC is an old spec. I mean it it's 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 been around like back you know at least back to Java one point four. The last release of Java that people would refer to with a one dot prefix. After that is Java five, Java six, on Java seventeen, which I think is it's supposed to be technically one dot seventeen because there's never been a Java two, but it probably the specs even say seventeen. So this is an old spec, and it's and if you look at it and you if you read how it works, the way you have to open a connection, open a cursor, submit a query skim the results, close results set, close connection, that whole song and dance, it's a pain in the neck, but it's not JDBC's fault. Because if you go to any other technology from that era, whether it's Python tool or whatever, C, C++, they all do the same song and dance because that is what relational databases demand. So don't blame JDBC. That's just the way it worked. And they just, they codified it so everybody could at least have a common set of APIs and not keep rolling the same solution. So what is this JPA thing? Well, JPA is the Java Persistence API. And I always chuckle when you have one acronym expand out to another acronym. So it's the Java Persistent Application Programming Interface. And I, I've seen three and four level acronyms when I used to work in government contract. But um, <laughs> JPA is essentially the standardization of what was called Hibernate. Hibernate is something that arose back in the, the 2000s as this idea of we're burning up way too much time basically mapping tables to Java objects. You know, it's like if, if I've got a table called employee and it's got a column named first name and a column called second or last name and a column called role, and I've got a Java object called first name and last name and a role. Why do I have to keep gluing that together in the 50 queries that I'm writing in JDBC for crying out loud? I mean, come on, that's that's absurd. We're we're supposed to be engineers making stuff easier, and it seems like talking to data are <laughs> so. They developed Hibernate, and Hibernate was wildly successful. People are like, "Oh yeah, that is cool." So. 
by going into your POJO definition and you create what's called an entity, essentially you add, you add, it, it started off as XML. In the XML, I can define this field in the Java record maps this column in this database table. And I mean, that's kind of the essence of where it started. And when Java 5 came along with annotations, they made it where you could just do all that 100% with annotations. But if I define how the, the, the objects and the tables link together, then I can write a query in a common dialect that all databases will understand. That gets me away from writing SQL. It gets me away from writing data store specific SQL. Um, something maybe people don't realize is they may start off with a particular database. Maybe they, I started with Oracle. Other people may start with Postgres or MySQL. And the fun comes when you make the, the first time you go to another project that's on a different database and you're trying to figure out why doesn't MySQL query work? Because the SQL standard, and I should say standards, there's more than one standard. I don't have my XKCD graphic to talk about <laughs> the problem of having a standard. Um, but there is an ANSI SQL standard out there, but it has holes in it. So every database vendor, they implement the standard, but then they have more. And they have more features and more options because specs evolve slowly and systems evolve. Slowly. So <clears throat> the idea with JPA was you could at least have dot, you know, the thing could make, you could tell it, Here's my JPA query. I'm talking to Postgres. You handle it. Now, I should have said Hibernate there. It started as Hibernate, and eventually the Hibernate people basically took what they had come up and crafted with, crafted, and uh, <clears throat> they they turned it into a standard spec. And so now mm -hmm. Hibernate is the reference implementation for JPA or Java Persistence API. And this again lets you rise kind of like one level up. So let me move up a level away from writing that. Crazy JDBC code all the time. Handwriting. Well, those, ro th those row mappers were a pain in the butt to write. Every time you needed some, especially when you had like, you know, 20 fields in a in a POJO. Oh, that was just. We're not going to talk about EJBs? But what about EJBs? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> That's just another no, acronym I, we don't need to, to bring into this conversation. Part of my cool origin story is that uh, before I came to the Spring team, I was working on this government contract, but we were not using Java. We were using something called uh, Forte 4GL. And um, don't confuse it with Forte for Java. This is a, co a startup company in Oakland, California. They got acquired by Sun Microsystems, and their code, their development practice and language was so incredibly efficient, they stole the name, or well, they bought the name and reapplied it to their other product, like Forte for Java stuff. And it, the Forte for Java had absolutely nothing to do with Forte for GL. I haven't heard uh, Forte in a long time, but I know that I used it. Uh, so yeah, throwback. There's been a lot of those. You didn't use you didn't use what I used, which was that original product. They had their own language called Tool, Transactional Object Oriented Language. So you could sit there and write a select statement and you could like select star into my widget that's going on the screen. And I mean, it, it was cool. It had distributed support built in. It had its own runtime container. It was run right once, run anywhere. And Sun Microsystems acquired them because they were clearly competitive. So, and then they did <laughs> the project six months after our contract started. So the amount of support I could get quickly vanished to zero. Um, so, Anyway, the the um, get derailed here, but the whole idea was like let's let's just let's just elevate things up a level. Let's just move and so I I you know I, I basically worked on that and I kind of sidetracked the whole EJB thing. And so EJBs had gotten sort of unpopular by the time I joined the Spring team. And I'd also I'd also dodged JavaScript that whole time too because they had their own thick client app stuff that I worked on, so. Well, Dan was having fun probably learning every JavaScript tool. Okay, and I was learning <laughs> none of that. Not even jQuery? Uh, I realized I needed to start boning up on jQuery when I was kind of early on in spring. I was like, I need to know some of what, what, what does jQuery do? And then I remember talking to a teammate. I will not name him um, without her. his permission. But, uh, <laughs> I said, or her. Oh, him, but uh, anyway, the um, I wouldn't say, What do you think about jQuery? And he said back to me, If you have more than four lines of jQuery in your code, you're doing it. <laughs> and 
And yeah, I, 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 those are words I, to live I, by. I didn't like JavaScript early on, but I had to learn it. I need I needed to know it. And then jQuery came along, and I was like, "Oh, this is this is fun to write again. Like this is not this is not painful." So, um, yeah, that kind of changed everything for me as far as JavaScript goes. And now I'm a huge fan. So, I like the oh, I was like React JS. React to me was cool because uh, that was getting <clears throat> lifted you up from glue and together stuff with jQuery looking down here in the dom for something with jquery and instead it just said let's just lay out all these components and based on state of stuff i can change what it is and let the framework yep. go update the dom yep i think we have a question from somebody that might have joined sure. late i have a question please what method do you recommend to implement a dynamic query with jpa based on the presence or not of fields in my search filter that's a perfect question because this is um this is perfectly what query by example excels at. Um, in fact, we even added, I, I implemented the addition of uh, query by example to Spring Data R2DBC because it essentially lets you grab grab those fields that are in the search box or whatever that, that, that on that, that GUI entry. And you can basically make them optional on the web controller. Your Spring web controller, you can be optional on the fields that are coming in. So essentially that translates to, or call them nullable okay so they can so you can get a null so you just all the fields copy them into a pojo object and then there's this api example dot of that object and by default um spring data's query by example will search based on which fields are not null now out of the box its default is to do a complete match on each field so it's it's this field equals that and that field, but you can go in and tweak the probe that you configured to say, I want it to be an and, or I want it to be an or, or I want the matching to be partial. a contains, not an equal. So you can make it a, each field's a partial match. And that actually lends itself to, you can go write a universal search where it's just one field, like a Chrome browser. I'm going to enter this thing and just take that value and uh, paste it in to all the fields and use query by example and say, I want to make it a partial match. If it's this or this or this or this, then go with it. And so to me, that lets you make that dynamic search without you writing, because otherwise you have to go write a combinatorial explosion of finder methods to match all. <laughs> right. That's what I was going to get to. At what point do you like say, I'm, I want to write this method in my interface called find by first name and last name, find by first name and last name or email address. Like at some point when you're writing those, is that a signal to you to go, all right, we need to move over to kind of query by example? Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> or just start with query. Well, by that's example. what, to me, the, the, when I first learned about query by example, I was like, I was, so I was implementing that feature for Spring Data RTBC. I kind of caught on to what it was doing. And then I was, part of me was thinking like my other teammates had not really shared it heavily with other people. And I'm, I was in the middle of writing a book and um, I'm sitting there like building, you know, I already had the idea to go have a search box. And then it like dawned on me. I'm like, wait a minute, this is what query by example does. It, it, it fits to this thing. Because if you're in a circumstance where like, I don't know what field are and are not filled. The user is picking that and it's going to change every time. I realize that's what, for my example, does. This, like, you know. I think, qualifies. Uh, we, we were having a conversation uh, not too long ago uh, about some of the things that are really, really valuable in the Spring ecosystem that maybe we forgot about. Like, what are some of those golden secrets, some of those recipes that just makes life so much easier? And I think this definitely qualifies as one. Yeah. That every system, or not every system, lots of systems need that feature. And Spring and Spring Data just makes it easy. You don't have to think about that. I, I could think of at least a dozen projects that I worked on where, oh, how do we, how are we going to implement search? And you know, we you're are trying to trying to shove something in. You feel like I'm fighting this API. I'm trying to shove it in. Well, maybe you need to pause yeah. and think. Is there an easier way? Because some. Because sometimes you don't need any of this. Sometimes gotta be what I need way. is I'm fighting the I'm fighting the the utility that was provided. Maybe you just need to sidestep it and roll the SQL directly and just shove it into the engine manager with what you're needing to do in this situation, you know. I'm very glad you brought this up, Deshaun, because selfishly, Nate and I are giving a talk at KCDC in a couple of weeks on spring recipes. 
common yeah. solutions to common problems. Yeah. And I think I'm going to um, go ahead and add query by there. example in there. <laughs> yep. So cool. Um, so. Not to shift, but I did see one other question that I don't know I can answer specifically, but it says, is there anything that Django does better than Spring? So uh, again, I get this question a lot like, hey, I'm using this framework and this language. Uh, why would I move to Spring? You know, and again, if your team is using a specific language and framework and it's working for you and it does all the things, great. Uh, I wouldn't, I don't see a need to move. If your team is a Java team and for whatever reason you're using Django, then maybe there is a reason to move. But a lot of these frameworks for me kind of all accomplish the same things. They go about it different ways. Um, but they all, if you need to build a web application, um, I hear Python and Django is a great solution for that. So that's kind of my answer. I'd love to get your thoughts on it. Hey, Python's always a cool, cool answer. I, mean, I dig Python. I, I started, I read Mark Pilgrim's book long ago on, um, and I can't even remember what the title of it is on Python, but it's like just a walkthrough book about how mind-numbingly simple Python is to solve stuff. So, um, so I really dig Python. Except the, and, white sp except the white space. The white space in the... <laughs> Shut up! <No. laughs> I like that. That that is one you want to you want to get controversial. That that's the bomb to throw in the middle of the conversation. But uh, I, to me, to me it was I was cool with it. But uh, I can understand people's aversion to that. But uh, and after that, later we'll be talking tabs versus space. Um, <laughs> whoa, 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 why are you? Oh. We're trying to have a, a, a normal conversation here. This why is a you... civil conversation. Um, <laughs> but uh, I'll add up I until know, now. Python is know. what TCL wanted to be. Okay. I don't know if you even know what TCL or Tickle is, but oh, yeah. that Tickle was built with this idea that we could wrap C APIs with a scriptable language. That's what it, but it, it grew enough sentience that nobody did that. They just used Tickle <laughs> for what it was. And in that case, it's ugly. Um, unless you're using Expect, then there's nobody that does what Expect does in Tickle. But Greg, but, we haven't uh, had a lot of conversations, but I spend a lot of time with Raspberry Pis. Uh, and up until Spring Native, the one thing that was I could always argue is that Python ran better on Raspberry Pi. But not anymore. Not anymore. So is there anything that Django does better than Spring? You asked me a year or so ago, I would have said, yes, it runs better on Raspberry Pi. But now the answer is no. No, there's nothing that Visual Django does better that than Spring. <laughs> Raspberry Pi, that's cool. Yes. And, and, it, and it's, you know, I wrote an article recently. I have a link. You can go to springbootlearning.com slash medium. Uh, I wrote an article that's actually generated a, a lot of action because I picked a controversial title, when to not use Spring Boot. And uh, part of it's like, you know, if you're if you just joined a team and the team that you joined just spent three months of meetings and email threads picking out to use the Django, the decision at that stage may have been made. And it's great. Right. It's kind of unprofessional and rude to sit there and say, hey, let's go to Spring Boot. Okay, maybe in two years' time when they, they come back and they want to revamp or they want to build the next tool, that may be the time to insert your opinion on Spring Boot. And it may be, this may be the time for you to knuckle down and learn what the system does. Okay, so, and did Django, did Django's got power. I think I've seen newspapers and other systems and built systems on top of the Django. So it's no hmm. vaporware toy either. So. Right. Yeah, Fuel Stables talking about Python and startup and performance. And and that's what I was talking about with Spring Native and especially what's coming up with Spring Framework 6 and Spring Boot 3. The startup stuff has been uh, addressed. Uh, it, it takes a lot of work, uh, but with Java 17 rebase and the addition of Graal VM and the, the native uh, AOT uh, ahead of time compilation, the startup times for Spring apps for for large Spring apps that include the JVM and all the good stuff, uh, yeah, is sub and, second. And Greg mentioned it earlier, but startup time is not always the biggest thing, right? Like there are a yeah. lot of workloads. You know, we've talked about this on the Spring One tour, Deshaun. That yep. there are a lot of there are a lot of workloads and applications that uh, are right on the JVM. Garbage collection has really like come just done amazing things in the last 20 years. And and there, there are workloads that 
are better, you know, so what that it takes a few more mm-hmm. seconds to start up, as Greg said, it may run for a year and uh, the JVM is just a, a really great runtime. So it just depends on what you're doing. If that's a good throwback. It yeah. depends. <laughs> you know, and up until Spring Boot kind of emerged on the scene, I mean, I understand people's pension for, I got a startup company. I need to have, I need to be putting code updates out daily. So I understand people's desire to go to Ruby on Rails because my goodness, you could actually build your multi-million dollar, million dollar startup on, on Rails like that, you know, back in the day. Because I mean, Java, the JVM is sort of like a truck if you want to compare other to you know other platforms as being a car so truck they can carry a bigger load but they move slower people are like why why do we why is our trucking system built on trucks trucks drive on average slower than cars and it's because trucks haul more load they you can fit more in them and this is the reason why you pick reactive versus imperative With imperative programming maybe we, we all know this and stuff it's not reactive programming isn't faster but it may be a ways a lot more efficient at the way it's using your current resources so i can use imperative i may need 10 times as many instances running in the cloud and my cloud bill may go to the roof but if i go to reactive you know with a little thought and consideration i may be able to trim my cloud bill and then my the ceo may give me a you know a certificate at the end of the year to some work we're doing so you're saying it's it depends. to the cafeteria it depends <laughs> Yep, it depends. depends. Excellent. Um, Good question. So, I know people are itching to like let's let's get a little more of this content out there. So, what is R two D B C? That one popped up, and I could understand a lot of people like, "What the world is that?" R two D B C is the Reactive Relational Database Connectivity Specification. So, just go after you after the stream's over, go home and say that three times fast. Um, and it's a it was a spec that was initially designed by the spring team and it started about four years ago and it was the idea of there's a growing interest in reactive programming we were just talking about it the metaphors of cars and trucks and people want to use reactive programming and reactive programming lends itself to functional programming uh, which i won't delve into right now but uh, but 80 percent of the people want to talk to relational databases and relate current relational database drivers something you may not know is that jpa uses jdbc when you write a jpa query under the hood it gets translated into the local dialect of sql and piped through a jdbc connection into the database itself and those two specs jpa and jdbc are blocking they have blocking they wait they su- they submit something to the driver and they sit there and wait and they hold the thread up And reactive programming, as your two-sentence summary, you need to let go of the threads. And essentially, you're putting work on queues. You're like, here's some work to do. I'm going to create a stack of work. Do this, and then do this, then do this. You know, when the results come back from this, map it onto this, and then put it back on the queue. And under the hood, the reactive-based programming is managing it for you. It manages the threads for you. You know, three out of four jobs may be on one thread, but the fourth job may be picked up by a different thread. And so JDBC and JPA come to a grinding halt when you try to do reactive programming through them. Um, Something we've learned in 30 years of research and analysis is that if you have four cores on a machine, a thread pool of 4,000 doesn't get you any further. It's, It's in fact, we also learned this empirically through JavaScript toolkits where you have one thread in the browser where if you take a, a, a more reactive approach where instead of thinking in terms of I need lots of threads, instead I can have as many threads as I can have actual physical workers on the CPU, um, you can actually have scalable solutions, but you need to break that, you need to break apart this idea of I'm going to submit a job and wait for the user and, and tie up this thread when the thread could be going and doing other work. So we basically went and wrote a spec to talk to relational databases, but with a reactive paradigm in mind. So we use JDBC as kind of inspiration, and and we sort of wrote this from scratch. And we've been and we've been putting it out since then. So, um, and it's you know it's it's recently reached I think a 1.0 status. So it's been a lot of development, but now there's other uh, community members contributing. Stuff. So we have support for MySQL, Postgres, 
Uh, I wrote the support for H2, which, my goodness, was that ugly. But anyway, the... Uh, <laughs> I know Oracle's the in there. We, the other stuff we learned is that JDBC has one, one interface to rule the world. So the, 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 inter the spec that driver writers write against and the spec that application developers write against is one and the same. So there's stuff that they put, you know, they, they put into the spec that maybe should have been here, but they got here. So there's there's a certain amount of leakage in there, or there's certain stuff that driver writers have had to implement over and over and over because they didn't put that in the spec. So there are certain patterns repeated. So we made a point to kind of have sort of like there's sort of a two-layer effect here. So there's this is what drivers write, this is what app developers code against. And to go hand in hand with that, we simultaneously worked on a Spring Data R2DBC version of that. Um, so that's like your, your your lesson in specs here for today. So you're ready to go take your pop quiz for your uh, university exam now. Um, so to talk about these toolkits, so I wanted you to understand what the things are. What 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 means do we have at our disposal to connect to databases, to particularly relational databases, and that's what they are. So now with that. Seated, maybe we have a better understanding of what these tools are. And the first one on the list was JDBC template. Now, if you didn't know about this yet, if you start looking for templates in Spring, Spring Framework, Spring Boot, Spring Data JPA, Spring this, Spring that, you're going to find the template pattern in all kinds of places. And Dan was hitting at the, hinting at that earlier, that um, sometimes there's operations that we it doesn't need to be hard. In 2008, Rod Johnson's opening message at the Spring Experience was, Spring is here to reduce Java complexity. Uh, I think Java had been very good at like, let's go capture standard behaviors people are doing and put them into the spec. But it sometimes it took patterns like JDBC, for example, and their style, and it just sort of throws them into, this is how Java's going to do it. Java's just going to talk to the database the way the database says we should. And JDB, JDBC template was like, hold on, what, do you, what, is, what, are, what are developers doing all the time? Submit a query iterate over the result. That's it. That's all they need to do. You talked about having to write that nasty roadmapper thing. Well, JDBC template says, okay, here's an API to run, you know, J JDBC template dot query. Here's a SQL query. And here's an object, an instance of an object called employee mapper. And I write one time the code to map this column to this field. And then I can write 50 different queries with this template and that's all I need to feed it is that that instance that object that road mapper I don't need to deal with open a connection open a result set open a cursor whatever and then closing that because the, the problem people were running into with with the standard solutions was uh, I'm going to write this query I'm going to do the manual process I'm going to open the connection run the query close the connection and then I'm going to get to the second one open connection run query close connection and by the time end of the day and you're writing your 10th query I'm going to open connection I'm going to run query okay it's time to go home and then you forgot to put the close operation in there and then the next day you write 10 more and by you know after you've written 100 of these operations three or four of them you forgot to do the close operation and so you don't find out about it until 3 weeks later when the database crashes because of uh, there's no more cursors left and you're scratching your head saying what happened and you you track down and find the first one and you fix it you don't realize there's two more and the whole idea of jp template is why does why does a developer need to manage that mental model and this is also before we had the try the try resources thing in java because today you could arguably beat that thing with native construct this whole idea of i need to I need this block of code to run inside a closable object. But what did that take us? Eight years to get to that? Longer. So JDP's template is like, let's ease talking SQL to the database and focus on what the developer needs. So there's like a couple operations and that's it. So if you're having to write some, I, I need to write this query. It's very simple. I'm going to do it. I can always go to JDP template. And do that. Yeah, and this is, uh, this is really a great intro for someone who's new to Spring, right? If, but maybe they've worked in another uh, stack and they're used to writing SQL. JPA is a lot for someone to kind of take on um, right away. So if you need to get into an application, connect to a database, write some SQL, this is a great intro before having to dive into something like JPA. Because I'm used to writing SQL, I can go write my select statements and I can get some data out of the database. 
it depends on where you're coming from too, right? I've been in a position where, yeah, I was I was comfortable writing uh, the SQL queries and the database made it easy. So I, oh yeah, I know how to do that. And JDBC template, JDBC template was easier. I've also been in the position where uh, JPA was easier or Hibernate was easier. But then at scale, uh, things get more complex as you, it's easy with JPA to add children and JPA is gonna handle those queries, but sometimes those queries aren't the most optimal and it becomes harder to debug. So at scale, uh, we needed to go the other way. We needed to go from JPA, the high abstraction, down to uh, JDBC, JDBC template so we could get the help and we could help uh, identify where those issues were, where we needed to optimize better. Uh, and we could pull in DBAs that had more expertise around what's actually happening in that database system. So we we went, I've, got, I've seen it go both ways, uh, changing mm -hmm. the abstraction layer, uh, depending on what's needed at the time. And, uh, you know, and that's a good point to Spring's all about bringing options to developers. It's like, here's your choices and you may need, you may know the best context of what to pick. So I'm not going to tell you, you know, always use JDBC template or never use it. Use it for what works. And that's the mistake. That's the mistake that I've made. That's the mistake that I see the most is like, oh, well, we're going to use JDBC template. Oh, but it doesn't do this and we can't do this fast. You don't have to pick one across the whole board. You have these yeah, options, yeah. and that's the biggest mistake I've seen repeated over and over again, no matter what the technology is, out, even outside of uh, Spring Data. It's like, oh, well, we're going to do it this way. And, oh, no, we use this thing to do all the things. You don't have to do it that way. And you may not know this, but if you go to project and you put in Spring Data JPA, which throw this slide up here, if you, if you have a project, a Spring Boot project, and you've pulled in the Spring Boot Data JPA starter, it pulls in Spring Data JPA, but JDBC template is also in there. You can auto wire a JDBC template into any Spring service that you have, and you can just drop down to that level. Because you may be like, okay, over in this subsystem, I'm having to work with these relationships and all this stuff. But over here, gosh, I've got to write that mind numbing query that joins 20 tables. And, and it's like, and so, you know, choose what works. Um, so, Spring Data JPA is the thing that now gives you, you know, gives your app wings to fly. Now it's um, it gives you access to JPA, but it gives you there. And the whole thing is that we we found out when they stand when they had uh, what what ended up in the standards, you had this thing called an entity manager. And so if you're writing pure JPA, you have to go interact with it, and you need to go learn it. And it's not, I don't know, it's not simple, or it's not there, it's not hard, but it's. But there's a you know orchestrate there's a dance to, to using it right different, you, you, different. Um, you know i don't want to besmirch people for having built something it's a cool toolkit and uh but you need to understand how it works and you know the concept of jpa was like well gee, do i really need to go manage all that mapping that we were just talking about and i mean it's I need to manage that. And so the, 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 the kind of the going in the first five minute promise of Hibernate JPA is that I can get away from that if I can just structure the entities right. And that's kind of true. And then it's kind of absolutely not true because the further you keep going in, you can reach, you know, the ninth circle of JPA where you kind of do have to understand what relational databases are doing or you're going to write or you're going to do it wrong. And it's almost like, you can't get away from understanding what relational databases do. Uh, I, I was laughing out loud uh, that I like that. I'm going to keep that one tucked in. I have two two new ones. Spring Data JPA gives your apps wings to fly. Beware the ninth circle of Spring Data JPA. I said the ninth circle of JPA. The ninth circle of JPA. I was like, JPA, this is what JPA does. So, um <laughs> So the whole idea with Spring Data JPA is let's let's one of the paradigms in the Spring Data projects is called aggregate proof, and this is something pulled out of domain-driven design. This, this whole idea of like let's have an ecosystem of here's all the objects that are related, and so draw a big circle around there. What are the operations related to that? So there's a sense of of um, you know your aggregates are where you come in and interact with. You can have you know these parent-child relationships. So typically you deal with through the parent. And it's interesting because there's that's, that's like one of the uh, books that has actually weathered the test of time very well because it's not so technology specific as concept specific. The main driven design by Eric Evans. So that was like 2004, uh, huh? 
Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, it's been around for a while. Great book. So that's a book you can go buy it today and read it and have a sudden world's better understanding of what spring data is doing. But you don't you don't have to have read it to be able to leverage it. And um, I would even go as far as to say as it's a really big book. I'm not saying don't read the whole book. It's a very good book. But the first like four to six chapters are really the heart and meat of what you need to to learn around like DDD. So, uh, but read the whole book if you have the time. <laughs> but spring data, and actually what's funny is the first spring data module had nothing to do with JPA. It was with Neo4j, the uh, graph database um, was where they actually experimented first. There used to be a JPA template in spring framework. Long ago, if you go Googling, you can find that in older versions, but they've since, they've since, uh, deprecated and remove that because they expect you to work directly with the uh, session entity or whatever the entity manager. Um, but in Spring Data JPA, the in Spring Data the idea is you can define a an interface and we'll call it, you know, it's a repository. And you don't have to extend anything from Spring. Uh, you can essentially define an interface, define finders, finder methods, you know, find, you know, find by last name, find by first name with parameters and spring data will go scan that it will go scan that and then part of it what you have to do is you have to declare the entity type through a generic parameter so at the root of spring data we have this project called spring data commons that all the modules point back to there's a repository interface with nothing inside and it has a it has a, par a generic parameter which is the entity type and the key the the key type the primary keys type you know whether it's a, a long an integer it could be a it could be a pojo type but and uh basically you extend that so and it's got in in so then you can start writing stuff it'll start parsing it spring data will then when the app starts up it'll see your interface it'll scan it and say aha i know what that is and then it kind of wraps the thing with a proxy and inside the proxy it's able to to, to switch and route the method into the correct implementation so whether it's pipes you into the query by example method or it routes you over here to what I call query derivation where they parse the name of the method or there's options where you can put named you can you can, what's called a named query where you actually write the jpql or the sql stuff in a xml file that gets scanned and read in then that's linked to the method through an annotation or setting but um, basically and and what you do is in each each module, we have things like uh, Spring Data Commons has something called CRUD repository, where we just have some, we've just pre-made methods that work. Find all, find by ID, delete all, delete by ID, this uh, count, we have counters. So those are the, the main actions you get to do. Uh, but Greg, in the CRUD repository, we've returned this thing called an iterable. <sighs> Just don't like I working knew, with iterable. I knew you'd go there. <laughs> so what Spring Data Commons does is it's kind of under it's it's kind of trying to to uh, walk the fine line between what's what's practical for end users. How many of us use iterables every day? Very small, but and what is what's going to serve all the data types, all the data sources or modules, I should say. And right. um, some of these data stores can actually take advantage of scrollable cursor result sets. So there could be an idea that you know, your data store may have only fetched, you know, the results may be this big, but it's only pulled this much into memory and it's able to move along. And that is what the iterable pattern. Is. So in that context, it's iterable, but if you use CRUD repositories, immediate sub interface that is in Spring Data JPA called JPA repository, that method is overridden with a, with a finder that returns a list, a Java list. And and I like to mention that root repository with nothing inside it because you're always free to either use the ones that have been kind of pre-baked versus you can just go create your own. You can go create your own base interface. In fact, I know somebody that's uh, over in Europe that built the system and they he baked, baked his own variant as a root repository, like his own version of CRUD repository that all of his repositories extend. So you can make it where every return type is string, not a string. Yeah, and this this is a great use case. I know a lot, um, pe people have asked me the question before. How do I how do I write read only repositories? And 
And that's it. Just extend the repository that has no methods in it instead of extending CRUD repository. And just write whatever read methods you want in there. Find all, find by ID, find by first name and last name. Now you have a read-only repository that particular uh, controllers may use. Um, and, and then, yeah, uh, just a great, great way to do that. So cool. Now, there has been a lot of feedback over the years, and we actually, man, I, I remember dialing into a chat to discuss this heavily when I was in a parking lot. This is the fun of, you know, working through the internet. Um, we had a Spring Data team meeting, and we really discussed it heavily about iterable or list. Should we move it to list? Should we move it to iterable? It's like, the idea is, I, I think the idea is the iterable lets you do this thing. I, I think that, um, like JPA, we know that uh, Hibernate and Eclipse Link, the two concrete implementations we support, we know that they hand you back a list. It's already, all the data's already been fetched, okay? That's one of the yeah. reasons why JPA repository has it. So like, what should we do? Should we go ahead and move it there? Well, what if we start supporting another one that doesn't have it? We could never walk that back. So we made the decision mm -hmm. to add, the called list cred, oper list cred repository. That's at least very close to it. But so we have a variant of it that, is list based so that is you can pick up and run with that um, and use that instead um, and that just extends the regular CRUD repository so you get all those methods too. yep yep it, is, it extends that and then overrides the ones with iterable and place in the list so yep. that seemed like a good compromise we've had other people come to us and offer a dozen different can we have a stream CRUD repository solution and we said no <laughs> You so can make people, your own really easily. <laughs> roll your own. That's the that's the night we're going to close the ticket and say, that's a fantastic idea. I think that's best left to you. So you can go back to that. Yep. Yep. And then with a big smile on your face. So. So, so that is, if, if, you're, if you want to move into the land of, you know, I want Hibernate to manage it, right? You know, and maybe this is what you're familiar with. You may run into systems that do this. Spring Data JPA let, gives you access to JPA, and JPA is incredibly powerful. But whereas you get away, you, you get away from writing data store specific queries. That is like a huge plus because it is a. I mean, I remember working on an Oracle database and then going and writing. I built a super slick query that somebody needed, and then but this was a business manager, and they needed it in their Microsoft Access database that talked to the same <laughs> engine on the back side. And I pasted my query in and it absolutely broke because string concatenation is not a standard feature. And I was like, you know, <laughs> so JPA lets you rise above that. But what it does not let you do, if someone's telling you this is wrong, is that it doesn't get you away from understanding what one to many relationships are or many to one. And I, I had this, um, you know, senior software engineer at my previous company that, he was he 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 knew Oracle inside and out. He knew relational databases, and and he was uh, very skilled. And his whole thing is, SQL is not rocket science. It's not hard. It's not complex. You just need to understand it. And by the time I left that contract, I'd been on it for ten years. I could do left outer joins in my sleep, you know. I, I and so the idea is, if you think you're going to go in with JPA or Spring Data JPA based system and not have to understand what left outer join is, then you're your that's delusion. And they're very they're powerful if you understand what that is. So so if you if you're coming to spring one this year, towards the end of the year, come and find me and say what the heck is a left outer joint? <laughs> Plug for the conference. So that was fun. We talked about JDBC template. We talked about spring data JPA. What in the world is spring data JDBC? Because we've talked about how you know I I I've humorously called it, you know, I've, I've, I've seen it referred to as the abyss, that when you start going down into JPA, you're, you have to learn more and more and more. And at some point you realize you know more about JPA than the next 10 people you know of that's worked with it. Kind of like, how did I get here? Because um, it seems like a never ending thing. You're like, sometimes it seems like it's too much. It's eating up all your time and you <laughs> avoid the nice circle of JPA. I like that. So, you know, and I'm trying to be lighthearted about it. You know, it's 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 a cool technology, but sometimes you don't need that level of detail. Sometimes people have said, I just want I want to I want this JDBC stuff, but I want it with the Spring Data repository approach to it. And that's what Spring Data JDBC is. I think it I think it started about five years ago, and our teammate uh, Jens Schauder is the lead for that. 
Um, and so it's the idea of, can we, is there something kind of in the middle between the two? So we start, they started off fresh and said, what if we drop some of the assumptions you get with Hibernate or with JPA? This, the whole thing that JPA is going to manage absolutely everything, all the connections, all the relationships. What if, what if the user kind of does that directly? What, how far can we get with the concept of spring data if we drop some of that stuff? And the answer is amazingly pretty far. And then I think it was also in 2018, it was either 2017 or 2018, when I saw Jens give his first talk at a spring conference about spring data at JDBC, it filled the room. People were hungry for this kind of, I want JDBC. You know, the other phenomenon you run into is in spring data, you know, in, in JPA, you're not writing the queries, you're writing the stuff. Um, Um, you're not, you know, you're not writing the, the query so much as you're you're writing JPQL. JPA translates it into Oracle, and if you turn on logging to see what query got written, you're kind of like, what the heck is that? I don't understand what that is. And we've had people come to us and say this query is being is wrong, and we would look at it and we would say, well, actually, the, actually that query is identical to what you're asking for. They both do the same thing, and if you run them through the explain plane, you can see that, you know. So JPA was correct in that instance, but. So people are like want a sense of give me the control back of uh, JDBC, and so this is what Spring Data JDBC does, and um, it's it's really fascinating. It's also it also has some of the benefits of if you start fresh, you know, if you start fresh today, it doesn't have as much inertia or stuff. You know, there's a lot of things that we're having to support decisions that were made years ago, and Spring Data JDBC is a little fresher, a little lighter, and it's pretty cool. So you may want to go take a peek at that and see if. You know, before you pick up the sledgehammer Spring Data JPA, maybe this is the one for you. Can I tell you my favorite feature of Spring Data JDBC? You can use records with it. Uh, so if you're on the latest version Whoa. of Java, you can use records, cut down all that ceremony of Whoa. your domain models. Uh, that's my favorite part. I've said, <laughs> I've heard all I need to hear. I have honestly never <laughs> taken Spring Data JDBC for a spin. And uh, yeah. That, that's yep. what I need to hear. I will say I'm still pretty new to it. Um, I think one of the things that I'm still trying to wrap my head around is relationships because in the JPA world, I'm used to modeling one to many, many to one, many to many with some annotation, you know, mapping to some other, some other domain model. And I haven't really figured that out in the G spring data JDBC world yet. Um, it's not a lack of, documentation or, or it's just a lack of trying. I haven't got there yet, but uh, that's my next kind of hurdle with Spring Data JDBC. So, you know, and so now that we've covered the big three, then I, if I tell you what this stuff is, this should, probably should be kind of straightforward. So R2 DBC template is just, you know, in building Spring Data R2 DBC, you know, we had some common operations we kept using over and over. So we, Mark Paluk refactored that, Mark Paluk, excuse me, the current lead for the Spring, Spring Data team, if you refactored it into a R2 DBC template, if you will, a workhorse to carry out R2 DBC oriented operations, and that got put into the Spring Framework. Now there's a there's some R2 DBC, there's Reactor stuff in Spring Framework, and so it's essentially how to if you want to talk to a relational database and react to paradigm, don't you may not want to go straight to R2 DBC because it's kind of low level. R2 DBC is the thing that says you don't need to do the dance, you don't need to do the stuff there. Instead you reactively submit your query, your row mapping pattern, and so it lets you do that, but you know that everything is reactive, you know, underneath it, all the way to the database. So, you know, for the for the, the slim margin of people that need to go do that kind of gory stuff, there you go. You got it. And if you've already seen JDBC template, you know, JDBC template was my first love. That was the thing that pulled me into Spring Framework when I saw that. I'm like, what is this thing? And I, I started looking, I'm like, wow. Oh. So, you know what that is, and then you can probably maybe kind of sort of guess what Spring Data R2DBC is. It's like Spring Data JDBC, but for R2DBC. Now, you try to say that many letters all at once, like the space-time <laughs> continuum may implode, but anyway, the um, Spring Data R2DBC, they both, that and Spring Data JDBC have a common parent project called Spring Data Relational. So, there's 
aspects of if you if you learn one of these, the other one's going to kick in pretty well because they the way they handle queries, the way they do parsing and stuff like that, kind of the same thing between those two projects. Um, you know, is there going, you know, the other question I get all the time is, is when is Spring Data JPA going to support Reactor? And the answer is absolutely never because JPA is not reactive. And, you know, my side hustle of running Spring Web Services, people are asking me when, are, when is, you know, SOAP stuff going to support Reactive? I say never because no SOAP third-party library is ever going to speak Reactive. So, <laughs> so hopefully this you know sheds some light on what these things do it's 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 to bring to you the power to, to do this stuff and, and in all these toolkits there's there's escape hatches because in a sense that we can use query we can talk about query derivation these finder methods we can talk about query by example but sometimes you need to use it but in the repository this one method i want to stuff in that query that joins 20 tables well just about every module Spring Data module has an at query annotation. You can stick on a method and just put your own query. And if the count query for page, that supports paging is different, you can go, there's a field for that in that annotation. So uh, you can also at any point in time in your app you're using Spring Data JPA say, I need an auto wired copy of the entity manager. Just give me the entity manager. I'll talk to it myself for better or for worse. Um, <laughs> so, we give you we give you the hooks. It's all sitting there in the app context, and you know, you 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 do what you need to do to get your job done, and uh, we don't we don't want to be the ones that get in the way because that just makes for bad press, right? This has been good. This has been good for yep. me. Yep. Um, I think you know we we had a similar conversation at a Spring One Tour Stop last week about testing. You know, there's just so many options to testing in the spring world. So many annotations, so many guides, so many different libraries. Sometimes it's hard to get started because you're not sure like where do, what what are these things? When do I reach for one or the other? So uh, I, I, I the same kind of goes with spring data. The spring data project is very big. There are all these different things that you talked about today. So I think the first step is really just, as you said, kind of, understanding what each of these things do now that you know that now you know at least which one to reach for and start learning that particular thing so uh that this was great thank you you know if your skill set is, is if you've been working with jpql for years then it should be to me a natural fit to just reach for spring data jpa if you're if you're coming over from something where you've been writing sql for years that maybe spring data jdbc is the place to start at for you for example and and this is some of the stuff I like to, you know, I want to I like to put this kind of content on my channel and, you know, go to go visit my channel, Spring Boot Learning. And so I want to put stuff to show that. I've, I've got stuff showing how to test stuff. You know, one of the questions is, well, if I'm going to use this, how do I test my app using it? And there's different strategies. You all, yep. you know, the next episode of Spring Office Hours is right in itself. So you can <laughs> I'm on testing it sure is. Yep. Yep. Cool. Well, do we have, I know we've still got a bunch of people here in chat. Does anybody have any questions for Greg or? There's one question I'm not sure that we answered. Uh, I'm going to take a quick uh, stab at it. You know, making sure that the options that are in the uh, query by example are from a list. Uh, and yeah, you can implement that. You can, in your implementation where you're grabbing those fields uh, from your UI, you can validate that. That's easy. And you could also populate your UI by doing a query of those things that you wanted to grab from the table. Uh, yeah, that's definitely a, a case. Uh, I think I understand where you're going with that question. Is, hey, I want to make sure that my dropdown only has this list in and make sure I'm only querying by, or maybe I only uh, query by some subset of the things. But yeah, those are all possibilities. I hope I answered that. But yeah, this is, this is the time where, like I like to say, like if you leave here and you still have questions, that's on you. We're here to answer your questions. Greg, thank you so much. You did a great job. I learned stuff, so I hope somebody along the way, I'm, I'm sure we answered a couple of the questions. And uh, yeah, this is the time where we, we want this to be an office hours. We want it to be interactive uh, and bring your questions. And it doesn't have to be around spring data. What? What are you working on? We might not have the answers, but we, we have Slack and we can get people like Greg uh, to come here and answer. Yeah. Them. 
<laughs> yeah. So in every office hours, we always talk that, hey, if you ask us questions and we don't have answers, there are people we can slack. Greg is one of those people. <laughs> yeah. And if not, that's cool. okay. If there's no questions, that is absolutely okay. Uh, we appreciate everybody for joining us and we hope to see you next time. All right. Thanks again, Greg. Thanks to Sean. Have a good one, everyone.